Hi, everybody. This is Patty Negri. Welcome to the witching hour. Yes, the witching hour, that hour of the day when the veil is thin and magic indeed happens. I have one of my most magical and dearest friends on today. So let me tell you a little bit about my friend, Dr. Lori Ann Perlman. She's a clinical psychologist, author, and film producer. She's known for her practice as a spiritual psychologist. She was intrigued by the concept of life after life from an early age after reading a magazine interview with Dr. Elizabeth Kibler Ross, a pioneer in near-death studies. She is the founder and CEO of the digital treatment tech company here, Global. She has appeared on Psychology Expert on national television and programs, including CNBC, MSNBC, Nightline, The View, and Today. Been interviewed by Barbara Walters, Martin Bashir, and Hoda Kolb. So let me introduce you to really smart, really magical, really spiritual, beautiful woman, Dr. Lorianne Palmer. Hi, Lori. How are you? Hello, my dear Patty. How are you? I am, I am so good. I am just so thrilled to have you on my show. My guests are going to love you. This is beautiful. Um, again, we have, when we first met a couple of years ago, now I guess, we decided how much we were the, so the same in, in our philosophies and life and what we do, but from such opposite doors and how we go play in the middle. So, um, so as for my friends who don't know you out there, tell everybody a little bit about you other than like your bio stuff of what you're working on now and your perception of things coming. Because I know you want to talk about spiritual hygiene a little bit, and it's probably something we need. And it, it's it's got a medicinal kind of label, and I got to work on that as to what <laughs> grab people. But, um, you know, uh, I had the honor of being at Quincy Jones house a couple of times because I have an early history in show business and his battle cry to young musicians was always you got to know the rules to break the rules you got to know the rules to break the rules so I got my doctorate in psychology in clinical psychology but I really come not as a doctor of clinical psychology although there's 30 years there I come as somebody who knows how much we need spiritual interventions, that we are not three-dimensional, we are interdimensional, we operate among many dimensions that are concerts to us, consorts to us, and those waves, particles, and force fields that work against us, you know, that we need to transmute and work with and do it in different ways. So I come as a Doctor of Clinical Psych, who is ready to break the rules with you, Patty, my love. Yay, yay. Um, so uh, what do you think is going on now? Is there extra need for this? We'll just call it spiritual hygiene right now until you come up with a funner word, but it's a fine word. Do you think a lot, and if it has to do with a pandemic or just the age we're going into, how is it affecting people? Well, I am... Um... I'm gonna say this in the lightest way I know how, but it's not so light. Okay. I think when mankind has always had man's inhumanity to man, that's been since the beginning of time. And these energies, these waves, particles, force fields, darker energies that fuel off of fear, chaos, you know, denigration, manipulation, domination. They've been around since the beginning of time, just as the light is, we work, together. But when man started to work on the atomic bomb, even though we are all one and it's illusion that I'm about to say, when we decided to split the atom, a separation consciousness came into being that had never been that divided before. We never had contaminated our food source for future generations. We may have been horrific, to each other in that moment through war or denigration or desecration, slavery, all of that. But we had never really contaminated future generations. This is a need right now for all of us to band together to look at the dark differently. This is what I feel spiritual hygiene is. It's a perception shift on our unity and what is required to 
not be so polarized that yes, light needs dark and you know, the sun will follow the night, but it is, or precede the night. But this is a different time. This is a different time where I believe exorcisms are needed, where we need to go into the demonic, the satanic, the un, um, the unattached, the disincarnates. We need to cajole them into an understanding that they are not the evil, they are simply coexisting with us, but please would you understand that in some ways we've exhausted our need to operate from the same way that we've been operating all these eons and start a new earth where we invite them to transmute, that they have exhausted their need and we're not killing them off, we're not sending them back to sender, we're not expelling them, we are asking them to reconnect to a new expression, which means as though you were working with a five piece combo, you're inviting them to expand into the orchestra of what transmutation could look like if they went into goodness and brought all that they knew from before and all that they are and don't kill it off I know it's anthropomorphizing them, but in that separation of knowing that they're not going to die, they're going to expand, they come into a new expression that will uptick the frequencies of the earth. That sounds beautiful to me and for everybody going, mm, yeah, but how do we do that? So, um, so you have somebody who's not good spiritual hygiene or on the dark path, I'm going to oversimplify the words in terms of things. Um, so it's not like, oh, get a bit behind me, Satan. It's like, come with me. And so somebody sit and look at themselves. Oh, I'm of this path or I'm of that. Or you see your neighbor. How we do that? First off, it's in you. It's in you from the beginning of time. This is not that the dark doesn't reside in you. We have from lifetime to lifetime to lifetime from generation to generation to generation, we have brought in our DNA, in our extra body, our spiritual body, our etheric body, we have brought these fields, waves and particles into our next lifetimes. This is a part of us. So as we welcome all pieces of us and not splinter off to this is unwanted and we integrate ourselves, we can better actually integrate those extra energies when we're working with others. You know, if, um, as I understand, this audience is already very sophisticated in beautiful transmutations and incantations. And so this is not something that you haven't thought of. You know, when we build a shield or we build a, um, an experience of uh, high frequency, high vibratory, purity of heart, power of love, those darker, lower frequencies can't reach us. We know that. But what happens when it's living inside of you? We have to do some excavation, some real understanding. So how do we use ourselves as a microcosm? When you get a pang from underneath the bottom of your foot, it's typically a knock on your door from a lower level frequency, a lower level energetic, a lower level electromagnetic expression. When you get a pang in your ribs or high pitched tone in your ear or the chills or a knowing, we, we as empaths, we will check, where does this come from? You know, and I anthropomorphize, like what, what do you call yourself? Why are you knocking on my door? What fuels you? Why are you here? And go through a systematic excavation inventory to honor it. It's almost like honoring yourself. So let me see, is that a little bit clearer, Patty? Um, uh, well, a little bit. It's like looking at things. Cause I, I know what, what I teach, which is off subject, not off subject, what mediumship I teach 
body language in a sense knowing your almost like your tells like a poker tell what the chills mean what a thing means here what thing means here so you're but i'm looking at just regular communication with spirit but i think if i got that you're talking the same thing but you're figuring out where it's coming from and, and asking what do you do so yeah i think we're saying the same thing the transmutation to me is a very important piece to the new earth because we've lived in polarity too long. And how do we bring it into unity is really a perception shift or an invitation. We invite the good, the goodness to elevate with us. Why should we not invite the, the lower frequencies to elevate into goodness and have a bigger uptick in what's going on in the world? Because we seem to be at a tipping point. So the contamination of mother earth the epidemics, the weather changes, you know, what's going on right now is kind of a perilous moment. And the mental health aspect of what's going on is out of control. There's a 70% reporting of mental illness in most American families, but it's much higher. It's what's not reported. Having done psychosocial histories in a hospital, which had nothing to do with mental illness. I was just doing the social historical, you know, overview of the family. Every single family I dealt with had mental illness at some level, whether it's addiction or abuse or depression or, you know, I mean, on and on and on and on. I don't have to go there. So what's fueling the mental illness and why are these numbers not getting lower? Why is man's inhumanity to man not getting lower? Why is sexual abuse not getting lower? So we need an uptick. And we who work with all of those frequencies, who work with all of those energies, how do we invite in a revolution? How? <laughs> not a small question and it's not a small answer. And actually I would, invite all of your listeners to engage in this. You know, how do you transmute the difficult ones that you've tackled? You know, whether it's inside of you or in another that you're working with, you know, at a, you know, how do you do seances, okay? So not every disincarnate has gone to the light. Not every soul has gone to the light. As near-death experiences is one of my specialties. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who you mentioned in my bio, she was at the University of Chicago in the 60s and dared to take on the Western medical you know, community as being one of the very foremost authorities on death and dying. She was bedside to cancer patients, and they would call out the names of loved ones that had been deceased. She would check with the family, and she was bringing to the University of Chicago, which was then the premier medical school in the world, that there was this idea of life after life, which the indigenous and the tribes, we've all known this for a long time, but she was daring and she got excommunicated from the medical community over that. And I went to meet her and she turned me on to the other doctors that were daring enough to go against the tide. Ken Ring was at the University of Connecticut he was studying near-death experiencers and what they could tell us about below, you know, uh, through the veil of three dimensions, excuse me, and what happens in life review and what the messages from beyond were. And then there was Ian Tucker and um, Jim Tucker, excuse me, and Ian Stevenson that were doing the work with kids across the world that had 90, 80% recall on past lives. And what we've learned from watching them is that we bring some of these proclivities from lifetime to lifetime. So for instance, let's say you were a witch in Salem and you got burned at the stake. You might in this lifetime have a fear of public speaking because your truth got you killed. Also, when they were hung in a past life, you tend to have a birthmark on the neck, you know, from being hung. So we have echoes of life experiences that need to be fulfilled in our new life. 
So we're transmuting our difficulty through the earth school because this is a dense realm and the changes are permanent. So too, do we have the capacity to change the etheric realm? I, I like that. And I'm a perfect example of that carrying with you both my last life as someone in Hollywood who we paralleled lives completely and my weird, I always had a fear and, and I'm, I don't have illogical fears as a rule. I'm pretty, I have this horrible fear my whole life of railroad tracks and armored cars, no reason. And in LA, you know, where we live, there's railroad tracks that haven't had a train on them in 50 years, but oh, I get so scared. And on one of my first past life regressions, I was like, on a horse somewhere robbing a Wells Fargo um, the train. It wasn't, it was a train. And once I saw all that, you know, whether that was a death or all, those fears went away for like 30 years. So it was like, yeah, I see how we could pull it. So you're saying go in there and look at this stuff and you could wash, literally wash, <laughs> clean. Reconcile. Yeah, because, and elevate. So these near-death experiences, let me give you an example of this one man, Tom. He was 40 when I was speaking to him, but he was um, 33 when he was under his truck and his son, nine-year-old son, was handing him tools. The house was built 25 years prior. At that precise moment that he's under the truck, so this is destiny, the 25-year-old air pocket of the asphalt collapses. He's dead under the, the car. His etheric body, which is completely intact, completely intact, which is why we know the brain is just a processing organ. The soul is what's really in charge, has complete agency, even though he's watching his corporal body on, underneath the truck. And he's rushing to the light and he's having simultaneous life review, stopping action at every point in his life where it's not reconciled either extreme guilt, shame, joy even. So he relives this moment at 18 in his truck. He's got the green light, but this old man rushes in front of him. He's got a slam on the brake. He threatens the guy by flipping him off. The old man says, I'll freaking fight you. He pummels the old man, he peels off. In life review, he becomes both of them simultaneously, himself at 33, remembering that he had a hair trigger temper and that this was a moment where he put a governor on that hair trigger temper because he peeled away and didn't give a crap about the man and he could have killed him. Then he also simultaneously becomes this 56 year old man drunk night after night from the bar on the corner, getting bested by this kid saying, you know what, I gotta get back to the land of the living. I'm wasting my life. And in that moment of mutuality, you in our life review, what's to come, is we forgive ourselves, we forgive the other, that there's always, everything is for us, nothing is ever against us, including the darker energies. They are a catalyst for evolution. So if we're making grand leaps to elevate that which is around us for light and love and goodness, then we must honor that which comes in as a presentation of dark to invite it in as well. How I do it is unique to me. Patty, how you do it would be unique to you. Like we all have a different mission it is to love, but we have a different way, a little different signature in the way that we operate through our work. So let me ask you, Patty, like when you know, when you're up against the dark at a seance or in a situation, how do you transmute it and invite it? Um, like you said, I, I being the elemental girl I am, I, I will actually pull into this earthly realm to use the tools that I have here to fight or, or deal with or transmute even what's up there. Um, I will, yes, work with spirits and energies up there, but I'm just so, I'm right now I'm in this corporal body, I'm here, I'm tangible, I'm this and this, it's like my tools are from here. So, um, but again, you're right. There's a million right ways to do it. Everybody finds their own. To, to get from my house to your house, who's to say one way you could walk, you could drive, you could do this, you could do that. I, I think 
that's the joy of it all. But it's, I, so would it start with awareness then? Consciousness. Yeah. You've been instrumental to my work. You know how we, as you said up front to everybody, we've worked together. Patty has been instrumental to my work in helping me look at the dark differently. And I really took what she said to heart and, and worked it in a way that's specific to me. So I don't necessarily do, you know, witchcraft, but what I do do is if something knocks on my door, I know that this field wave, particle, electromagnetic something has knocked on my door for a reason because I make, have a mission to uptick the evolution toward more love and more light. So you're not gonna come to me for no reason. And I will anthropomorphize that field of energy or that being, because I can feel it just like many of you can. I will anthropomorphize it and ask it, why are you here? What do you need? What fuels you? I will honor it. I will see it. I will value it. I will try to understand it. In that moment of its being honored, which is really why it's here, just as we all are, it has the capacity to then understand the invitation, which is you have exhausted for eons the need to work the same way just as we have. Wouldn't you enjoy going into a bigger expansive understanding? And most of the time it's yes. If it's a disincarnate that has a fear of not having fulfilled the earth realm, then I will ask if it's okay for me to send in a battalion of angels, Archangel Michael, Archangel Gabriel, Archangel Uriel, Archangel Raphael, Archangel, all the angels to surround it and escort it to the light. If I feel that the field is oppressive, oppressive grabbing of my throat, oppressive incubus on my chest, an overtaking of me, I will turn myself into a magnet that is equal to them, not bringing me together, but will bounce them off of me, that I create a shield, an electromagnetic shield, because most of the time they're electromagnetic. The dark also can go into those higher dimensions. They are not 3D, they operate from outside of 3D. So we have to get higher than them in order for them to be able to be contained and to be communicated with, including, you know, and this is where we go into what, what I love to talk to Patty about. I was born and shown at a very early age that I did not come from this planet only. I have had lifetimes here. I, this is way before star seeds were in the zeitgeist. This is way before Alpha Centauri was even discovered but I was told I came from Alpha Centauri and I was sent here because Alpha Centauri is a non-dense, non-corporal area that has a commitment to love. But just as every planet has its expressions and earth is a school of learning how to give and receive love from a dense physical form, Alpha Centauri was learning how to give and receive love from a non-physical form so we could merge, you know, and that gets me into trouble with people because you've met people where they lean in too far in your personal space, like but you can also lean in too far energetically and get yourself in trouble. Patty, I feel like I'm rambling and I don't want to, I want you to in no, no, you're not. I'm intrigued. Everybody's intrigued. This is beautiful. You're not rambling. Thank okay. you. All right, no, just, I'm, I'm there. We are here. Right. Leave room for you, my beautiful friend, to interrupt me. If I, but okay, so when you're from another place, which many of us are, even if we've forgotten, we've had many lifetimes on, in many dimensions and many realms to learn the grander lessons. So there's the arc of many lifetimes on earth to complete, but there's also the arc of many many, many, many places. And um, there's many life forms and, and expressions all over multiple universes. We as a individual, when we evolve, we affect all time space realities. 
We may never speak a word of what we do, but just showing up at the dry cleaner in your edge, in your electromagnetic field and what you've done, showing up at, you know, wherever you go, you know, the grocery store, the energetic exchange of what you've accomplished as an individual affects the template of where we're going in all time space realities. So I know this is huge, but the consciousness that created the problem is often not able to solve the problem, Einstein quote. So there were many of us, first wave during World War I, I'm a volunteer from the second wave post world, um, excuse me, World War II, I'm a volunteer from the second wave after World War II, there are young people now that are volunteers from the third wave that have come to uptick the evolutionary energetic field of earth. Because we are so dense, we have the ability to create change that is enduring. But because we are so dense, if we do destruction, it can be unfortunately a downward spiral. This gets back to the atomic bomb. So <sighs> Roswell. Roswell was the first time I, I am Roswell. Go, was go, 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 go. Roswell. Roswell was the first time that, um, you know, obviously there's been visitations from interdimensional visitations from the beginning of time. And we are interdimensional. So it's not about Roswell, but Roswell was where they were doing atomic testing. Roswell was when the spaceship was, it crashed. There was autopsies done. There was footage of the autopsies. There was corroboration, even though they tried to suppress it as a weather balloon, that we were being visited either by another dimension or it was us from the future coming to help ourselves. Oh, so sorry. Coming to help ourselves not get succumb, succumb to splitting the atom. Because look what happened after that, you know, was some well-meaning physicist go into Kellogg and say, I want to figure out how to genetically modify every grain of wheat, contain an insecticide that will contaminate humanity, take away all the protein and fiber of the wheat, only leave the sugar because it cuts down on the mill time of the wheat conversion to bread and destroy all the nutrients. How are we contaminating with fracking and all that we're doing just to not have the wherewithal to know what's going on for the future of our children's children, children. This is a first. So we've technologically advanced without spiritual advancement, which is why I stand here to say, when we work with these energies, when we work with all of this, not only inside of ourselves, but with others that we work with, whether it's through our readings or our sessions or our whatever we do that's our personal signature and working, try to invite the energies that fuel off of chaos, derailment, fear, you know, desecration, denigration, shame, the lowest frequency, invite it in to start expressing differently, that we are that bridge. We are that bridge. We are the ones that see it. So it's for upon us to help in the revolution of the uptick. I love that. And I'm sitting here going, my head's going all over the place. And, and that's all you have to do, guys. <laughs> Ah, it's a revolution. Uh, but how you were saying about that, embracing the dark and not seeing what it is, I am wondering, this isn't a not thought out, it's whatever. You know, um, I'm a witch. I use the term good witch. I'm a vampire and, I, and I'm a good vampire. And I'm wondering if our method, my very elemental method of so much now of the whole gothy world and this, and we're good people and we do good things, but we've got to have that little edge to it. I wonder if that's a 
a, almost simplistic or maybe deep way of doing that. Like, you don't have to be afraid of me. I have things. You don't have to be afraid of me. I dance around with a broom and a cloak, but no, I'm of good. It's, it's like changing perception. Maybe this, the, I mean, on, in my school, we have werewolves and vampires and Satanists and Catholic priests and across the board, but it's the school of goodness, but you have to, it's, but I'm just wondering, like, maybe this is our simplistic way of doing exactly what you're saying to do. I, well, I agree because you helped me understand the dark in a new way. So obviously you have a handle on it in a different way than I, you know, I intellectualize it. I analyze it. I'm trying to get an understanding of the, the intricacy of it through my lens and everybody works differently. I agree. It's not going to go away. None of us are going to go away. It's the perception and acceptance and invitation to elevate in a way that doesn't kill anything off. It's more expansive expression for a higher directive of keeping us around because we're at this pivotal moment. We're not going to ever truly go away because consciousness is eternal but we could get to earth to a place where we we are not allowed to live in this corporal form will transmute to another form and and that's something that maybe we embrace i don't know i don't know but it me we you know how you feel in alignment with your truth and your mission that don't judge anybody true don't judge anyone live your morality is between you and your definition of the divine it is not religion in scripture unless you believe it's religion in scripture your morality is you to your godhead and what is godhead to you a universal flow of love universal power of love the universal energies that connection to your alignment is everything once you're working with that alignment you're in your truth everything is fine. But once we get out of that alignment is when we cause a little bit of a, a wobble. And that wobble, unfortunately, right now is a big wobble. There's a lot of people not living their truth. And a lot of people are under siege. And unfortunately, um, in a stew of a lot of difficult saboteurs, curses, spells, um, a, lot of, a lot of difficulty that they don't want to live with. It doesn't really belong to them. It's the energetic reverberation of a field that's gone awry. And you know, if you don't agree, please write into Patty. We are so interested in knowing how you do what you do. Yeah, no. And again, what, everything that you said about the Godhead, this, that, we are exact same alignment. We have the exact same belief system. Again, we've, we've put different templates upon it. Um, and that's what makes it so special. No, I agree. So um, I'm sure my everybody's head's going, wow, yeah, wow, what? what? So before we go, which I'm just going to have to have you back because I've got 40 other things, but before I go, what is one or two things? And so I like to leave everybody with a little bit like, and try this one or two little things, whether it's an awareness change or a, a, an action that you would suggest people to like lead towards this. Or... Okay. So if you are feeling under siege yourself, you know, where you're getting attacked because you are a light worker and that energy does get attracted to the light and or you're working with it you know i would say the frequencies of service love joy gratitude are the highest frequencies the frequencies of shame fear you know denigration are the lower frequencies they're both like a negative ion and a positive ion they're not to be judged they coexist however to integrate them into unity requires an honoring. So it's a different, it's not like an exorcism where you're using prayer to expel them or a sacrifice to expel them. It's not about being excommunicated 
from humanity. It's about an invitation in to show both sides that they are up for a new expansion, not just the combo, the five piece combo, to invite in the orchestra, to get them into a unified field so that we can assist in a higher vibratory field of goodness. I love it. So out there, everybody, that's all you have to do. <laughs> um, and it, it's a, it, it is, it's an awareness change. It's a moment to moment. Um, we both do it, attempt to do it, go for that. That's our thing. And I think most everybody listening um, or watching, depending on which they're doing, are people who are on the path. So you guys with within your path, see where we go from there. Um, so if people want to know more about this, more about you, I know you see coaching and see people. So tell people um, how they can find you, what, what they can do. So uh, there are two offerings. Okay. One is very free. It's a, there's no, it's redundant, a free tool called Here Global Foundation or Here Global Relief. It is a app that's being used around the world to get you from the monkey brain of fight, flight, freeze to the parietal lobe, which is where those of us who meditate, nuns and monks, takes a long time to get there. This game that you play on the app is a trauma amelioration game that will get you to your higher parietal lobe. And that is the dimension of connected source, infinite access to capacity, to highest sacred source, the power of source, that we would most likely like to optimally operate from. So you can give that to people you work with for free. It's being used by the UN, Dignity Health, Pax Christi, the Catholic Church. You know, um, we have projects in Africa, Saudi Arabia. I've worked all over the world with this. And it is a peace initiative. You'll see that the globe, when you've done the exercise, you donate the globe to um, wherever your energies want and you'll see it all light up. With respect to sessions with me, go to Patty's website and you will see a Calendly invite and I will do a private session with you if you so need. But really, truly stay, stay on the path. You all are amazing to be here today with all of us and we appreciate you in so many ways. And the app, I oh, I meant to, I meant to, I'm glad you we brought you guys, it's an app on your phone. You enlightenment, balance in an app. Check it out. So say that name of it one more time. It, it'll be on Patty's website, but it is called Here Global Relief. It is a free um, supported app for your mental health. We call it, we don't talk about it as mental health. We talk about it as a pause to meditate, but it is truly incorporates many um, methodologies to combat PTSD and trauma. Okay, thank you so much. Um, you guys, Dr. Lorianne Perlman, again, work with her, get this app on your phone. Um, if you get confused how to find her, just contact me, <laughs> I'll hook you up. Um, and thank you, thank you for bringing your magic, your light to the witching hour. I love you, I love you. Aww. <laughs>